I get it. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Teresa Beam, and as you can see, my husband is not quite here yet. He's a nurse, and um, he often comes late to these things, but he'll show up. And uh, I'm Teresa Beam. This is Adventist Talk. <laughs> Pastor J. David Newman will be 81 years old in a few days. So an early happy birthday to you. <laughs> he, was, he was born in Cape Town, South Africa, was raised in Nigeria, England, Scotland, and in the U.S. And my guess is his parents had to have been SDA missionaries. In his Adventist adventures, he has lived in six countries on three continents. He married his wife now of 58 years and a happy anniversary. I know your your anniversary was yesterday, right? <laughs> um, no, it's tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow, that's yes. right. Uh, Pastor Newman graduated from La Sierra and then Andrews and then at Loma Linda University and got his doctorate of ministry at McCormick Theological S Seminary. He pastored in Scotland, in Ohio, where he became secretary of the conference. Then for 11 years, he was the esteemed executive editor of Ministry Magazine, a worldwide magazine for SDA pastors. That is when I knew him. He moved to assistant professor of religion at Washington Adventist University and taught for Columbia Union College and Avondale in Australia. Now to the really interesting point for Arthur and I when he gets here. <laughs> pastor Newman took the place of an SDA pro-life pastor, Richard Fredericks, at the Damascus Grace Fellowship. He has been pastoring churches in Lansing, Michigan, Burtonsville, Fulton, and Frederick, Maryland. He's the former director of the ministerial department at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, he self-identifies as an evangelical Adventist and on his Facebook page reveals that he only believes 13 of the 28 fundamental beliefs. <laughs> and that's probably less than I do. <laughs> and that makes for an interesting conversation, especially we want to know, and we'll get to this, if he believes in the last, the last day test will revolve, will revolve around the Sunday law. And how I know him is in April 1989, long time ago, the, we were at the first meeting of the Christian View of Human Life Committee, chaired by Albert Whiting, MD. Oh, welcome, Pastor Newman. Anything we missed that you want our audience to know? Now, keep in mind that a, a lot of our Adventist, uh, excuse me, a lot of our audience is Catholic. That's fine. That's fine. No. You, you've given a pretty good summary. Well, I got it mostly off of your Facebook page. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it is, uh, you have had a very long experience to your life. You've got some stories, I bet. Um, are you going to ever be doing a um, memoir of your life? Uh, I've thought of it. Um, I've, I've got two books that I'm working on that are devotionals, um, a New Testament devotional and an Old Testament. I was uh, on WGTS-FM for nine years and did a, a, a talk um, every evening of about three minutes. And so I've taken those talks and intend to make them into a devotional, but um, I haven't. The, the, the challenge is they were audio talks and I've got to turn them into written talks. So that's taking some time, the beginning and the end, and some of the illustrations have to be changed. So yeah, um, that, that's what I'm working on currently. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, wow. I remember, okay, so just a little bit of back, uh, back or, or context. I took very extensive notes at that conference in 1989. And I put it in storage, and my storage was broken into 
by it was a very crazy thing we don't know why someone would choose ours there was nothing in our storage but just a bunch of stuff but anyway someone broke in and just tore up our storage and i lost all those notes now it's possible i've got them somewhere you know that there's somewhere i just don't know where they are so I, what i'd like to do is kind of what you can remember we'll talk about what we can remember about that because that was a very important meeting because that was the first meeting of the uh uh, Human Life Committee. It was the very first of, I know they had several of them, and that turned out to be what was recommended to the 1992 uh, GC, General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist uh, Executive Committee, and they voted on a 1992 abortion statement because of the recommendations from that committee. Now, I was only on the first one. There were several after that. So, uh, I would just like to pick your brain. Do you have any memories of it? Before we start getting into my memories, do you have any memories? No, that's been a long time ago. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I have followed somewhat the, um, the uh, discussion, but the, 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 the um, um, yes, uh, I'll wait till you have any further questions. What I was wondering is, because I noticed you, uh, it is very interesting to see, you know, Catholics have a different view of what's conservative Catholic Catholicism, a traditional and evangelical, you know, type of Catholicism. And each group kind of goes a different way. When you go to Europe and you talk about, oh, I'm conservative, that means very something very different than it would at, in other places. So in mainstream Evangel evangelicalism, being pro-life is pretty conservative. So I saw that you consider yourself um, more like a progressive Adventist. You're very pro-women's ordination. Um, but what I was wondering is, do you still consider yourself pro-life? Oh, yes. Okay, oh, good. Yes. yes. So, so you just hit the spectrum on both sides. That's really good. And <laughs> that's good. Um, so, yes, uh, uh, let, let, let me just interrupt a moment. The Supreme sure. Court uh, uh, changed the, the whole dynamic, and um, I think that's very, very strange. Now it's up to each state to decide what their abortion laws are. And um, I disagreed very much with the Supreme Court decision, but that's the country in which we live. Okay, so why do you disagree with the, the Supreme Court decision? Well, it's... Um, it, it nullified the uh, standard that you could have um, an abortion um, for any any reason, and it's left it up to the individual states like Texas, which doesn't allow hardly any abortion at, at all. The mother may die. Um, the Supreme Court, before it changed its opinion, allowed the, the mother to have the complete control. But... Um, no longer is, is the case. Each California is still follows the same rules that the Supreme Court had before the change, but Texas and a bunch of others have made very strict rules, and um, I feel very sad for the women that are involved. Well, so what would you have liked them to do? What would Left you have seen? To, I, I think that it should be the woman's um, choice. Okay, so that's actually not considered pro-life. Yes, I'm very much pro-choice. I think. Oh, okay. The mother has the final say, not okay. the court. So when you were at the um, abortion conference, you did indicate you you were more on the pro-life. We had like about twenty. I'm thinking between twenty and twenty-five people there, and yeah. uh, at that time. A lot of the uh, people there were very pro-choice. In other words, they were uh, not wanting to take a stand as a Seventh-day Adventist church and give any protection to the to the unborn child. And you and I were the only ones that I remember that kind of stood up for the unborn. Do you do you have a different memory of that? Oh no no no! I, I think that the, the unborn is is uh, should be the main consideration. Right, right. And so so you take a more um you take that the church should be pro life, but then you know, you can have a pro a pro choice um federal laws, correct? 
What's the difference between pro-choice and pro-life? Well, okay, when you say pro-choice, that means you are politically on the side of allowing the law to allow the woman to make the decision. The woman and her doctor makes the decision as far as law. And pro-life says, no, the child needs to have a law that protects the child. So, so one is pro-choice as far as allowing the woman to make the choice, and one is pro-life, and it says, no, the, the baby should be taken into consideration, that it shouldn't be just simply a mother's choice. But when I was a president of Adventists for Life, most Adventists said, we do not believe abortion is moral, but they said they do not want to take away the woman's uh, legal rights to have an abortion. So would you kind of follow fall in that category? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. But then you did yes. you did you did not want the church hospitals though to be doing elective abortions because that's what I remember what you told me um during that committee, the human life committee. Well, t t today I I would uh, disagree with that statement. I would okay. think that um our hospitals ought to be able to do that. So you do okay. So you've changed your you've changed your opinion. Okay. So okay. Well, here here let's go into some of my memories and let's see if I remember it correctly. Now I was late to the first meeting. There were three meetings. It was over three days, and um, I remember that my okay. So my babysitter didn't show up on time. So I was late to the first meeting. And I sat down next to this woman who was a, uh, she had a very thick German accent. And at the first break, she grabbed my hand and she said, you do realize that we made, we all agreed that this was to be a completely um, secret meeting, that we all said we would not tell about this. And I'm I didn't know whether to believe her or not. Do you remember taking some kind of oath of secrecy about that meeting or no. agreeing? No. Okay. No. That's kind of what I've wanted to know all these years no. because, uh, you know, that was kind of interesting. I, I always wondered why they would want it to be secret. And so she might have just, um, maybe she just misunderstood what was going on. But yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. And I was also pregnant at the time. And uh, so when I was hearing a few of the uh, of the comments, they were there were some radically pro-choice people. There was um, there was a lady there from the um, the religious liberty arm. She was a lawyer for the GC. And she uh, was from the religious liberty arm. And she said some pretty amazingly scary things do you rem do you ha remember any of the conversations at all no no yeah. sorry no oh, okay well she said if i remember correctly she said and i wrote it down because it was so shocking she said because the seventh day adventists do not believe a child has a soul until its first breath that we can do anything before the baby is born. In other words, the Adventist church actually has in, in it, um, it's in the book, the 28 fundamental beliefs, you know, okay. uh, Adventist belief. Well, let me get it for, for my, um, the people here. Uh, it's the part, the nature of man. It says that a child is not a living soul until after he takes it, you know, after the baby takes its first breath. And so she said, whatever we want to do with the baby before it's born, it's completely okay as long as it does, has not had its first breath. And so what she said was, if you have a living child who needs an organ donation, that it's perfectly appropriate to get pregnant and have a child and abort it late enough where you can harvest the organs of the unborn oh child. Yeah, she said that. I mean, I, I I will never get over that because it was so shocking to me because yes. I was pregnant at the time. And so there was some pretty radical beliefs, but not, no, there were very few that were that radical. So my husband's here, so he's going to come in and join us. <laughs>
Oh, hello, hello. How are you? Hey, did you ever meet? Not formally. I, I, no. I've heard a lot about you, but no. So, never met um, Pastor Newman, this is my husband, Arthur nice Bean. Nice to meet you, Arthur Bean. Mm. I'd shake your hand. <laughs> <laughs> but his, da his daughter mm -hmm. works, uh, or is the head, or one of the, the pastors, right, at, at Richard Frederick's uh, church. church, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. wonderful. Okay. Okay. So, um, in general, if do you even remember the 1992 Executive Committee suggested guidelines? Do you remember those at all? How they turned out? Do you remember? No. Okay. So, have you kept up at all with what the church has gone through with abortion as far as its history? No, I, I really, um, really haven't. I, I couldn't tell you what the official position um, is. Um, uh, I, I, I believe that um, the mother has the sole right of the baby from when it, not when it takes its first breath, but from when it's conceived. And um, the mother has the choice of what she does with it. So that's how I've kind of uh, understood the, the situation. So but, do, you, do you believe there's any point where the, the child's life uh, before before it's born, the child's life would be um, uh, taken into consideration. Well, yes, I, I I think that the child before it's born should have every opportunity to be uh, to be born. I don't believe in abortions unless it's to save the life of the mother. If it's to save the life of the mother, then I have no problem. But an abortion that isn't um, the life of the mother is. Uh, I, I think, um, unnecessary. Yeah, well, in 2019, the church came up with some new official uh, guidelines, and that's exactly what they were. They were very, because before they had been pretty uh, lenient, but now they said, unless it's the life of the mother, uh, the life of the mother, that the uh, Adventist churches should not be doing abortions. That's the new protocols for the Adventist churches. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, I've been very happy with how it's worked out because they no longer do abortions on demand. And so they, they um, take in consideration the life of the baby. So I, I'm very happy with that. Okay. So, <laughs> so I think we're on the same page. Yes. I think yes. we're on the same page. Um, Okay, so now let's talk about your experience in Adventism, because that is, um, when I grew up an Adventist, they were very conservative. You know, the 1960s Adventism was, was not like it is today. A, you should be, a you of all people should be able to explain to our Catholic audience how has the Adventist Church um, changed over the last, whatever, 50 years? What have you seen? Well, it depends who the General Conference president is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Our current president is very conservative. When uh, Jan Paulson was the president, it was much more uh, liberal. So the church very much takes its stand from who the president of the denomination is, I published, I was editor of Adventist Today for a number of years, and I published um, four articles on four se segments of the church, the, um, the liberal, the conservative, the majority, and the evangelical. And each one had very different views on life and so on. And I tried to point out that the Adventist church, you can't put it in a a capsule and say this is what it believes. It depends which section of the Adventist church you are appealing to. And um, I've remained an Adventist purely because of the Sabbath. Um, I've, I've taken the view it was originally before um, sin entered the world, and it's still valid today. And so I still observe the Sabbath, but I don't believe in it. And as you mentioned, um, we have this strange situation where you only have to except 13 doctrines, but we have 28. Right. And this, 
there's still confusion in the church. You're supposed to believe all 28, but you only have to subscribe to 13. So I, I, I don't understand that, but I've come to the conclusion no church is perfect. No one yeah. is perfect. We live in a world where there's always different options. So um, yeah. I live with it. Well, you know, I remember my dad uh, back in the 70s, early 70s, he was helping out in the uh, early teen Sabbath school, and he was teaching the gospel. He was one of the first ones I'd ever heard, you know, and, and it became such a scandal because he was just teaching the gospel, you know, just by faith alone that you don't need yes. uh and he was finally he, this this the sabbath school that he taught started out with like three kids that would show up because their parents would make them mm -hmm. and by the time he it had at it for a couple of years it was standing room only he was very on fire for the lord he was very joyful and um at the end at the end of like two years there was enough people in the church that thought, okay, he needed to just do Ellen White, that uh, he was actually removed. And the and the, set, the little um, early teens went back to just, you know, two or three again. But I was, I mean, I remember the excitement the church had during those days of learning the gospel. That would you say, do you, would you see a trajectory about that same time where the evangelical wing of, of Adventism kind of started back then? Um, yes. Um, I've been through a progression just like um, you, uh, you have, and I've come to the conclusion that during the millennium, we're all going to find out where we were wrong in our theology. Yeah. I, I don't know where I'm wrong, but I know I am. You're wrong. You may yeah. not know where you're wrong. No. The only thing that's going to save us is our acknowledgement that someone else saves us, that yeah, we have nothing right. to do with our salvation. And so I'm going to find people there who don't even know the name Jesus. Amen. They just know that someone else was responsible. And during the millennium, we're going to find out what the real truth is. And that's that's the basic principle that I live by, that that's the only condition for salvation. Well, I, you know, a lot of people take the venue of, or, or the avenue of finding truth. They want to find truth, and they think that if they find truth, they're going to find Christ, which may or not, may not be true, because some people don't understand truth, or, you know, I'm saying they're looking in the wrong places for truth, but uh, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, avenue. Uh, but there's also the avenue of you, you're in Christ. He's the truth. As long as you have faith in Christ, he's going to bring you the truth. So we're not going to have a, a, a written exam <laughs> of theology when we get to heaven. You know, it's going to be, did you love Christ? You yes. Know, I yes. just, I, th that's just the most marvelous thing uh, of all. Whoopsie. Where'd you go? Oh, I just hit it. I just hit something. So um, anyway, I just think that's that is a very, very an exciting, exciting development in the church because my husband, see, I was raised in a really, we were called Gladvenists. Have you ever heard that term, Gladvenists? No. It was this, there's, we were, you know, it was the Dallas First Seventh Adventist Church in Dallas, Texas, and there were Sadvenists and there were Gladvenists, and we were the Gladvenists <laughs> because my father spoke a lot about um, faith, you know, faith alone. Yes. Yes. So anyway, but my husband, I'll let him tell you a little bit about, about his background. So I'll be quiet and just let him. Yeah. So my background came from my father was a. Uh, he started out as a Seventh-day Adventist teacher, then he finished his master's, and then he became a Seventh-day Adventist uh, principal and kept on, uh, uh, let's see, he was a principal for several years, but then he was the educational superintendent for the Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana conference. So mm -hmm. he was in charge of that area. He had to, he was the one that came up with all the books, the new books, and everything the for, curriculum for the curriculum yeah thank you and um the, the, we were very um staunch uh seventh day adventists 
And so uh, it, it. He was the. They were the Ted Wilson Adventists. <laughs> Yeah. How he's raised. Yeah. So, did did you ever know Venden Morris Venden? Oh yes, yes. I had a bunch of his tapes, and I yeah, I, yes. So he was he was our pastor there in Keene for a while, and boy, when he uncorked that righteousness by faith, I mean that was quite the the shattering. And didn't they? I think he got moved right after that. <laughs> the, yeah. the conference moved him to California or I something. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that was uh, as a young kid. That's the first thing that I mean that caught my attention, boy. You know, because it was so unlike the the older, staunch '60s and '70s uh, uh, way of of preaching. Yeah. Well, um, so tell us well, about... Let, 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 me, let me just interrupt you a moment sure. just to say that Adventism is dying in North America. Oh, really? And I say that because the average age is 55. Wow. The average age of Adventists is 55. General population is in the 30s. So wow. given enough time, uh, we're going to disappear. And part of that is um, we're too conservative. We uh, still have hymns in our churches and hymns uh, 200 years and older. The church, Adventist church I belong to, uses contemporary music, has a band, has drums, guitars, five singers, sure. Sure. Um, et cetera. And it's, it's growing. It has five pastors now. And, but it's the, there's only one other church in the conference that has contemporary music. The all the others still have, so um, the older, and, yeah. And I don't know how to change that, but right. let me emphasize again: the average age is fifty-five. Wow! So, so give enough point, time. Go ahead. So give enough time, Adventists will disappear. Wow. Well, they're not going to disappear in South America below the equator because they're doing quite well. I've heard. Yes. Yes. Now, but that's, they're more conservative than the ones in North America, correct? I, I, I don't know that much about mm -hmm. um, what's happening there and why the people are, are, are joining. I can only talk about North America and um, the issue of a women's ordination. Yeah. There's a, a conference in Europe that doesn't ordain even the men. They all have... Um, commissioned uh, licenses so they can all be members of the church board because the official view is commissioned ministers can be members so they've got rid of the ordination part and the denomination doesn't know what to do with them because there's no law against that so there's a few areas that are experimenting uh, within the the denomination and southern california has a lot of churches that are very progressive but uh, in uh, in Chesapeake Conference, where I am, um, there's very little growth taking place. And so, do you believe that it's it's the style of music that's contributing to that? The style. Well, that's, of that, that, that's only one of the uh, of the elements. Um, the church I belong to doesn't talk about the twenty eight fundamentals. I haven't heard a sermon on any distinctive Adventist doctrine. It's all been general and um, on the Bible and, and so on. Um, so I don't really know where the pastor stands uh, as, as, as far as that is concerned. Uh, we have a, um, uh, a um, coffee bar that's open during the services where you can get um, coffee and so sodas and so on for free, and it is, tremendously patronized so i can yeah. imagine yeah we're, we're a very different seventh day adventist church it sounds like it yeah. <laughs> yeah well that's that's really interesting because when uh my husband and i attended for oh my goodness probably 20 years i don't know that might be i'm terrible with numbers so i don't know but it was in the keen seventh day adventist church in keen and yes. we brought coffee and donuts and uh for i don't know years yeah. But it didn't go over very well. We were quite scandalous, yeah. <laughs> scandalous ones because we brought coffee and donuts to our Sabbath school. But uh, but there we have I we've always kind of 
been attracted to the um the joyful because people are not going to see i think it's the joy i think that you've got to live the joy of christ to bring kids yes. in yes yes and that that's what our kids need they need to see us joyful about christ and because we live in a dark world and as Daniel said, you know, I'm going to go to Daniel and Revelation, <laughs> but it's Daniel said, it's the lights against the darkness. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to draw people in right now because we're in such a dark world. And um, anyway, I think that's what's going to is, is our joy in, in the in the Lord. And I'll be quiet again. <laughs> I keep I'm preaching. <laughs> I'm preaching. No, I agree. I think that that, you know, when Morris Venn came through, there was a a joy about how he presented yes. and it, it wasn't a he wasn't coming in correcting people he was coming in bringing joy with him yeah and yeah i would have to agree with that the joy fact well just think about your how joyful people are with the coffee bar <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> that's very joyful that's right that's right yeah so um okay so Let's get into a little bit of doctrine. So where would you say you come down on SDA prophecy, future prophecies? Do you feel the church would, if they backed off some of the last day prophecies, that would be helpful? I've come to the place where I don't believe in prophecy anymore. Um, in fact, um, I'm working on a comment on Facebook. Um, I um have the most comments on facebook uh in, in um according to however they, they they do it but anyway um i've come to the conclusion that our forecasts of prophecy um for for, for example the sabbath mm -hmm. being a universal and uh, i've asked a question i haven't seen any answers yet well what about china what about india what about Russia? How are they going to deal with the Sabbath? They're not even even Christians. So I've come to the place that, um, and most of our prophecies are still future, all right? So it's been for 2,000 years. So if people want to say this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Um, when I was growing up, I was taught to um, be prepared to go into the mountains and have a cabin there and uh, and escape the persecution that's going to come. Well, there's no cabins anymore. There's no safe places anymore. Yeah. So, so that, that isn't even talked about anymore. So I've, I've placed that the most important thing is how we live today, mm -hmm. that Jesus is my Savior. And as long as you believe that, we can study the Bible together, but there are many different views on the Bible. That's fine. But as long as you believe that you don't save yourself and you seek to live according to what Jesus asks you to live, and that can vary from people to people. And I often use the example of the thief on the cross and Enoch. Enoch lived 365 years and was taken straight to heaven. Enoch, uh, the thief on the cross only had a few hours with Jesus, but both we're going to see both in the millennium. And what saved them? Not anything they believed about themselves, but someone else. So I, I use that as an example. Enoch has a lot less to learn than the thief on the cross, but Enoch still has a lot to learn because he wasn't perfect either. But he was close enough to God that God took him to heaven without him dying. So I've come to the conclusion that um, what denomination you belong to is not as important as what you believe about Jesus. Amen. And as long as you believe he's your savior, and as I said before, you seek to live according to everything he's taught, that's all that I ask of a person. Well, that's, yeah, I, I mean, we would just say, hear, hear. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, once we became Catholic, we realized, and a lot of Adventists are not aware of this, but we go to church on Saturday, on the seventh day. <laughs> on, do you know, and, and most Adventists don't realize this, but uh, Advent, uh, Catholics have services on Saturday. 
they have services every single day of the week. They have public um, mass and, they, yes. and, the, and they've got, and do you know that a third of the United States Catholics go to church on the seventh day? And so, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't know that. That's yeah, fascinating. And, and so I actually I did the numbers, <laughs> and so the numbers are from the Adventist website archives, you know, where they 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 uh, list uh, how many people go to Sabbath school, you know, in the United States, and I think it yeah. was on average about two hundred thousand Adventists in the United States are in the pews on Saturday morning. Now, would, does that sound outrageously wrong to you, about 200,000 in the U.S.? I haven't seen it. I've said half a million. Um, really? Okay. It, um, and, um, but yes, I, I could accept 200,000. That's why I said earlier, Adventism is going to disappear. Yeah. The average age is 55. Yeah. That's, it's getting older all the time. Yeah, that's it's kind of shocking. Catholics are the same, but but what I was going to say is, on those same Saturdays, Catholics, how many Catholics in the United States are is between five and ten times that many Catholics go to church on the seventh day, and most most um, uh, Adventists don't knew, know that. <laughs> And That's so right. we have more in common. Right now, I've got a son-in-law who graduated from a Catholic university in Steubenville, Ohio. And he said there, when he was there, there was a group of Catholics who rested on the seventh day. Now, they, they um, <laughs> because of the fourth commandment. And, yes. the, and, the, and, the, the, and they said that the uh, people at the university, and they remained Catholic, and they said they were so thrilled because they said they were the, the kids they never had to worry about because on Friday nights <laughs> they were uh, uh, resting. You know, they've already entered the rest until till Saturday night. And so you, there's so much more we have in common. And yes. right now, our, our view of life right now is they're going to know we're Christians by our love one for another. Yes. And I yes. think... That is going to draw people to Christ, no matter what, no matter what we're doing, <laughs> no matter if we're if we're Catholics or if we're uh, uh, Calvinists or if we're uh, uh, Adventists. Yes. And so, mm -hmm. anyway, do you have any anything I, I'm talking? No, I just love. I've, I'm I've been loving here <laughs> here you talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, give us an update on your church. What's what's going on there? Well, I pastored the church for 10 years, and when I became the pastor, there was one other, there were just two pastors, and there's 348 members. I pastored it for 10 years and then retired. After 10 years, it was 750 members wow. and four pastors. Now it's 1,000 members and five pastors. Wow. So it's continued to, to grow. Now, Martin Weber, um, you probably heard of him. He's yeah. written a number of books. Changed the the service from the traditional hymns and so on to contemporary music at the New Hope Church, and it was in Burtonsville. Mm -hmm. So when I became the pastor, I uh, inherited a a more modern service, and we grew so much that we had to sell the church and and buy this one in um, in Fulton, Maryland which was much larger and, and, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, what was the question you asked? Well, I just want to know, okay, I'm thinking in my mind, church models. You're, you're, you're talking about a model of church that's working. So, yes. so yes. And, what? And, and, and we have joined a number of organizations like um, I, I don't remember their names, but they take food to people and they help this group and that group and so on. There's uh, three or four organizations that our church is involved in in, in working with with people. So they're very interested in being the hands and uh, feet of, of Jesus in the community, not just preaching, you've got to come to church. Right. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That, that's really wonderful. So is the GC looking at this model that your church 
is winning souls and thinking about taking it because if if the church is dying why aren't they looking at your model that's working i've asked that same question <laughs> and 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 the just an interesting aside the president of the general conference ted wilson i first met him before he was married he was leader of a group of students at a evangelism in glasgow scotland when i was a pastor in scotland and dale brusset was the evangelist and he baptized 52 people which is still the largest group ever baptized and a group of seminary students came and ted wilson was the leader of that group he wasn't married yet and um then i became acquainted with him when he became um uh, part of the general conference and i was part of the general conference and my two daughters babysat his children during one of the uh, 1980 i think general conference session so we got to know him a little bit uh, there and I, I i've kept in touch with him about oh probably a year ago one of our members the, the wife died and he had the funeral and phyllis and i attended that funeral and he came and spoke to us and reminded us that we were still his friends and so on so i've got to know him very well but He's very kindly in his approach and so on, but he's extremely conservative in his theology. Yeah. So, question. So, now, your church, you've ordained women, did you say? Was that right? The, 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 the conference allows for women pastors, but not ordain them. There's only okay. three, there's three unions in North America that ordain women pastors. Okay. And the Columbia Union is one of them that does. But we have three sets of organization. Each has its own constitution. Conference has its constitution. The union has its constitution. Okay. And the general conference. So although the union can vote to support women being ordained, each conference has to vote that itself. So in our union, only three conferences ordain women, Ohio, um, Potomac, and Allegheny West. The others okay. have women pastors, mm -hmm. but don't ordain them, which is crazy. But they they have the same duties. Well, there's only two things they can't do: they can't ordain elders, and they can't ordain a new church. They can't start. Any, but other than that, do everything the ordained pastor can do. It's kind of so, crazy. Yeah, the the and the reason I'm asking is is I'm just going through. You, you're. It seems like you have such a successful church has the conference been giving you any grief over your coffee and, and cookies and things like no, that not, not, not that i'm uh, uh, aware of and the, the, the conference is interesting in that it has for the first time a black as secretary of the conference okay. so they're a little progressive in that sense that uh yeah. they're willing to in a white conference have um and he could become president if the Potomac Conference has a black now as a president, and it has 40,000 members. So there is change taking place, but it's a very slow amount of change. They seem to be supporting you, though. They're, they're not. Oh, oh yes, yes. As, as far as I know, they've not um, interfered and, and, and so on. And, um, and our pastoral team, the senior pastor is white. The um, music pastor is from Brazil. Um, the uh, outreach pastor is African American. The um, two lady pastors, we just had one left and a new one is coming in. Well, one is from Hawaii and the other is from the Pacific Islands. So we're very international in our pastoral staff. Regular UN. That's great. Yes. Yeah. That's great. And That's the, great. The congregation of 1,000 members. I'd say maybe 15% are white Caucasian. The other 85% are all different nationalities and so on. Wow. Wow. So it's, it's, it's become a very international church, and we have a separate children's service. Children don't participate in the main service because there's, there isn't room for them in the main service. So they have their own service taking place during the, the, the worship service. Yeah, we were very active in the yeah. children's church. Uh, 
a couple, three of us started the uh, children's church at Keen, um, the Keen Adventist back many, many years ago. Okay. So that's, that's okay. interesting. So anyway, okay. So if you, okay, let's just pretend and the crazy idea that, that Pastor Ted Wilson just turned this on. What, what would you say to him to help him, um, know the success of your of your church well there's going to be a general conference session next year and he's 73 so i'm hoping he'll be replaced oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he's old enough that uh, yeah. he's the second longest president um uh, uh um after the, the the guy 1901 to 19 19 but um i don't know what i would say uh, say to him because as as i've said when you study the bible there's about 500 different protestant denominations i've learned 500 different and they all use the same book the bible yeah. oh, and yeah. you use the same book we use the same book but there's different interpretations of it. So um, the fact that the conference has its own organization, there's nothing Ted Wilson can do to me because uh, he can't touch me because he has to work through the organizational system. And um, the only authority he has over a union is to disfellowship the whole union. Yeah. And that's yeah. never happened. And that's never happened. So... Mm -hmm. I think God set us up in a very special way in that each union, each conference is separate. And um, the, the fact that we still follow the general, the bulls of the general conference is, I, I, I think, fine. But within that, um, as I said, there are unions now that ordain women and unions that don't. And uh, there's conferences that ordain women and conferences that don't. So there's a lot of, of, of freedom in it. In so um, Wilson can't do anything to me and uh, can't de do anything to this church because the organization doesn't allow it. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Cause I did not know that. I didn't either. No. That, you know, because you think that the, the top down would be able to, to pull some strings and get mm -hmm. done what they wanted. Mm -hmm. but, uh, just, uh, just a moment, there's a church in California that has spawned seven other churches across North America, including one in, 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 um, up in New England. And it's a very contemporary church, has praise music and- uh, What's it called? It's, um, that's one of the things I've um, discovered about my age, my, my memory <laughs> of names. Um, oh, uh, File cabinet's getting very full. <laughs> It's a, it's it's a it's a church um, between Loma Linda and uh, Los Angeles. Isn't that and, um, um, the the senior pastor is the son of a student at La Sierra who was a theology student with me. Um, Gillespie is his is his Tim. name. Tim Gillespie. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I know. Well, it's his church. And uh, they've spawned seven other churches, and um, they've got an arrangement with the conference that makes them unique in that conference, in that the conference cannot get rid of the pastor without their permission. They have the final say on who the senior pastor is of the church in that conference. So mm -hmm. the church is a member of the conference, has all the privileges of the conference, except that the senior pastor cannot be got rid of by the conference unless the, the the church in California agrees to it. So oh, okay. that's a change in our system also. And um, I'm trying to get New Hope to follow the same pattern, but um, we haven't yet uh, established it that we can establish New Hope churches and other conferences. That's one of my goals. But um, And so the, this, the, this, this church, in a sense, is very, how can I put it? It's very non-traditional in, in what it observes and so on. And uh, 
whether they go through the 28 doctrines I haven't learned and, and so on. But the fact that they have seven other churches that are unique is, is I think, a good thing. And um, yeah. they, they, they can teach whatever they want, but the senior pastor cannot be disfellowshipped, cannot be get rid of at the conference without the permission yeah. of the church in California. So yeah. that's a strange mm. system, too. So yeah. our, 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 our church is evolving. And while I said the, the, the um, average age is 56, there'll still be a remnant because of churches like this and our church. Um, and uh, there are similar churches to ours. And uh, in Australia, um, I had an email from one of them saying that they had coffee in their church and donuts and so on. And they are very, very liberal. So um, I have a lot of confidence that the Lord is leading and guiding. Mm -hmm. But And the fact that we have these three levels of organization gives us a, a great privilege from the General Conference. The General Conference can do nothing with us mm. except to disfellowship the whole union. And yeah. it's never done that. No, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, so do you think the church, because... My mother was more traditional. She believed Ellen White was an absolute prophetess, and you don't you don't go against Ellen White. Where my dad was that no, she's a woman of inspiration, but we don't need to take her infallibly. And so, do you feel like uh, the church and and the young people that are taking the church forward would they have a more uh, a more idea that she's not infallible, that she wasn't, you know, she was a one. Oh, oh, yes. My, my, my viewpoint is that she doesn't apply to today. Okay. God raised her up for the church of her time because it's more than 100 years now since she died. Mm -hmm. And so many of the um, ideas today were not current in her day. Mm -hmm. So to use her as an authority, the only authority I accept is the Bible. And um, I don't accept her as an authority as anything today. <laughs> and, and our church, <laughs> well, and, and, and our church never mentions Ellen White either. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, she doesn't apply to, to our, our particular church. Wow. Did you ever think you'd hear an Adventist pastor <laughs> no, say that's, that, Arthur? <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that blows my mind. That's great. <laughs> That's, That's great. That's pretty funny. Yeah. So uh, bringing the joy of the Lord is. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's just wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. And she changed her mind on a number of things. So um, she, she's against coffee and tea. Well, we supply coffee and tea in our church. So if you're going to follow Ellen White, you can't have coffee and tea because <laughs> she links it as, as something that you shouldn't drink. But our church yeah. says it's fine. So. Well, a lot of no, the young. No, uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, of a lot of the young people that I know, because both of our families are mostly Adventists, and we got a lot of young people in the church, and they still embrace Ellen White just as inspirational writing, not not. Um, oh yes, the, the conflict of the ages series, five ages, and so on are, are, are fine steps of Christ. You know, Christ object lessons. These are, are wonderful, but um, even, great great even great controversy, there's some um, disagreement now on some of the things she said because she copied from other writers. It wasn't inspiration directly from the Lord. So mm -hmm. we don't even take everything literally that she wrote now in great controversy. But Desire of Ages is, is wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I'm not here to discuss Ellen White. Oh, yeah. Well, and then obviously the um, investigative judgment would probably be out, too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't agree with that anymore. Did you happen to see the Adventist um, movie that just came out, The Hopeful? No, was... no, I've, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. it it's the um, they it's just a revamp of the one they did years ago called uh, the series Tell It before... to the World. Tell it to the world. So it was just a, yeah. they all they did is just make it more compact and added a okay. couple of songs. But I thought the um, the acting was pretty good in a couple of people. So it had some really good acting in it. 
but anyway, so wow, that is wonderful. So, um, okay, I'm going to have a theology question for you. So John 3.16 says, you know, that um, the Lord came into the world to save the world. And, and um, okay, but right, if you read afterwards, it says that those one day who did good, their good deeds will come out into the light and they will see that their good deeds were wrought by God. And so earlier you had said there's going to be people in heaven that don't even know the name of Christ. And so yes. I thought of that text that they they won't even know until they get to heaven that their good deeds have been wrought by God. So am I reading that at all right? <laughs> that passage, do you recognize the passage? Um, no, as I said earlier, our good deeds have nothing to do with our salvation. Well, but they were going to no, but but they're saying that the good deeds that they did do would be have been wrought by God, so they would have believed well, yes. in some type of love. In other words, the the love that they had manifested itself in good deeds, and the yes. next day they're going to be yes. shocked. I, yes, I I I I believe that um, that we're saved not just. How can I put it? Good deeds are necessary to get to heaven, but they're not part of our salvation. No, I understand that. And understand um, that. if we come to the Lord, we're going to do good deeds. But these are going to vary tremendously, depending on our education, our background, our culture, and so on. Uh, but the point is that we're doing it because we love the Lord, not in right. order to to get any kind of right. blessing from him. Well, it does say, St. Paul says, the three things that are going to last are faith, hope, and love. Yes. And the greatest is love. And yes. love covereth a multitude of sins. So I do know that um, I see a lot of people that have rejected Christianity because of Christians, let's be honest. <laughs> Christians sometimes are very, uh, can be very harsh. Yes. And yes. Um, unloving. And yet those people who have embraced a, a true love, and I'm not talking about just a, a, a acceptance of all things, but a love that manifests itself in sacrifice. I think that's going to be um, a great judge of, of people too in the end. I think that's for people who who were not faith wasn't available to them in the same way we're looking at it now. You know what I mean? It, it, you know, that they the little formula of, you know, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? You do you accept him as your savior? You know, that they go through this formulaic um, salva salvation and maybe these people will have hooked on to Christ just through their love. Anyway, I don't know if I'm saying that right or not, but. I'm just turning to what I think are some of the key verses in Scripture. Um, Matthew 22, mm -hmm. where um, Jesus, um, hearing that Jesus had, uh, uh, in 22, verse 30, um, for hearing that Jesus had, Silence the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All, all, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen. That to me is the basis of Christianity, love to God and love to others. And, That's right. And uh, Jesus himself said, all the other commandments hang on those too. So th that's what I believe is, is most important, is how we love other people. Amen. And, Amen. Uh, during the millennium, we're going to find where we were wrong in our theology. And so, but as long as we agree that love to God is, is most important, and we don't earn it, that's fine with me. Amen. 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 You know, 
how how can we say we could earn it? How can we look at the cross and do anything but just want to bow our heads in praise and thanksgiving? You know, that's what we're going to get to do in heaven is we're going to spend all eternity in praise to him for what he's done. I don't yeah. think that um, we've even got a concept of how wonderful heaven is going to be because a lot of people don't think sitting and praising the Lord is going to be fun. <laughs> they, want, they want to be walking in golden streets. But um, yeah. but that's really going to be the whole basis of all eternity is that exchange of love with a creator that is so absolutely amazing that he gave his son to die for us. I mean, if that, how can Christians mess that up? <laughs> how can we make that bad news when it's such amazingly good news? Well, I, I've often wondered how is Christ going to speak to millions of people and each one sees it as only him speaking to them? Yeah. I don't understand that. Um, I'll have to wait till he comes to find out how that's going to work. But yeah. there's going to be millions of, of people raised and uh, yet each one is going to see him as speaking directly to them. Yeah, that's going to be pretty wonderful. The other thing I don't understand is how everyone on earth can see him at the same time. Are the people in Australia going to see him when he comes in the clouds in America? I don't understand that. I just accept what the Bible says, that every eye will see him. How they're all going to see him, I don't know. Yeah, I don't either, unless unless they're all right and there's a flat earth. I was going to say the flat earthers love that text. <laughs> we don't believe that. We don't believe that. But um, anyway, so we are not like Peter Dixon. We can only do our segments. But, um, but we have so appreciated you giving us your time. I have been looking forward to this interview for so long. Yeah. And, um, and I have just always had a great love for you. You don't, you didn't even know that, but you've had a big admirer all these years, um, ever since that that committee, and we so appreciate it. And and if we continue doing this, maybe in the future we'll be able to have have you back on. To yes, yes. Talking it's about something been, else. Uh, a great pleasure because I forgot. Well, it's been a long time since we were together, and I yeah. remember. And uh, and and I think if I remember correctly, us two were the only two that had a separate agreement from the rest of the committee. So um, anyway. Well, I, I, just, I remember you and I going out to lunch d during one of the breaks and yes. it was, it was um, Asian food. And yes. I remember having a long, lovely discussion with you and just looking up to, cause you're, you're kind of a tall guy, right? Yes, I'm six two. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and so I'm I'm five. I was yeah, I'm five three and a half. So I just remember <laughs> you being big, and I just thought, what a what a magnificent, powerful presence of of the reflection of Christ, and and I just it, it meant a lot to me to have you there because I was a nobody. <laughs> I was a little mom who was in her twenties, just a little bit <laughs> nobody, and I got to to uh, be acquainted with with the big guns. <laughs> that's right so anyway it's been very nice talking to you yes thank you so much for him yeah yeah, yeah. One, one last thing so you can tell you know uh, in the bible it talks about it just giving a cup of water to people yeah to yeah. a prophet to a prophet you're gonna have how much more is giving a cup of coffee <laughs> yeah this thing <laughs> yeah so you go. all your parishioners, they can give a cup of coffee to somebody. That's and, beautiful. And they'll get the they'll get the rewards. The reward of a prophet. Yeah. Anyway. Well, God bless you. Thank you for coming on. Yep.